Good morning, church. Thank you for bringing the church into this room. Would you stand as we begin our time of celebration and praise of our King and our Father, our Savior today? Let's make a joyful noise to Him this morning. perfected in love how many would be brave enough to raise your hand and say you know what there might be some areas in my life that I'm fearful okay so here's what we're gonna do right here in this place it may be in a worship service like this it may be I don't know that I want anybody to hear my voice it may be I don't know that I want to raise my hand because that makes me feel weird it might be any number of things let's pray to the Holy Spirit of the Almighty God and ask him to cast fear out in this place that we might be able to lift up a mighty shout of praise to a king who is worthy of our greatest praise and worship amen come on we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall you cannot survive when we praise you the God of great So Psalms 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let's make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all kings. So Father, would you receive the praises of your people today? In Jesus' name.
sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Don't neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to him. That's our goal this morning. So Father, be glorified as we worship you, as we adore you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you we sing holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up our
those who have been brought from death to life, your members to God as instruments of righteousness, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God, may that be our heart's cry this morning. As we sing. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O 
Lord, our Lord. God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our God is a good God. How good is he? Far beyond what eyes could ever see. Yet he stands in front of me. How good is he? canvas with a million stars yet still he holds my heart let's sing our Father in heaven the light of salvation oh how good is he the bread heart is all that I can bring. And still he welcomes me. Our Father in heaven, the light of salvation. Oh, how good is he? The bread Almighty before 
verse one more time. With all you got. Our Father in heaven, the light of salvation. Oh, how good is he? The breath of Almighty before and behind me. Oh, how good is he? Yes. Oh, Father, you are so good. And, and even when our lives don't feel good when we're in the midst of the storm when we're struggling with our fears when we're uh, dealing with doubt you're you're still God and you're still good and you're with us you will never leave us you will not forsake us you're with us to the very end of the age you're a good God we can trust you we we know your word tells us that we will have tribulation Your, your word tells us we will face trials of various kinds, that there will be thorns, there will be crosses to carry, and all of it, Lord God, you are good. Help us to believe that. And help us to be a part of the good that you're bringing to the world through salvation in your son, Jesus. Make us to be faithful. Make us to share the hope that transforms lives. Teach us to do that today. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, go ahead and, and be seated again. Thank you for bringing the church into this room. If you're a guest, thanks for worshiping with our church family. I guess there's a card in front of you. If you don't mind, uh, fill out that orange side and meet me out here at Guest Connect. At the end of the service, we got uh, a, a great gift for you, the world's greatest coffee cup, and just want to say hey to you. Uh, those of you who are regulars around here, use the blue side. Let us know how to be praying for you. Also, know you can do this all electronically. Just pull out your smart device and just point it at the QR code behind me or at the one in front of you in the pew or on the bulletin, hopefully, that you, that you got on the way in. Uh, we're having a, a big day today. Today is a big life, and a uh, big day in the life of our, our church family. Uh, at the eight o'clock, we had uh, a, a young person that was baptized. At the nine thirty, we had four others that were baptized. And this afternoon, we have eighteen. So, for a grand total today, we have twenty-three people making public profession of their saving faith in Jesus, which is awesome. So exciting. Uh, last week, we had three that did this, and so I want to share those with you. Uh, Connor Lux. I made public profession of his faith. Colton Lux also did as well. And Kern McDonald. And again, we're very, very excited uh, today uh, to, 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 um, to see so many baptized. So it's at the creek. Um, directions, everything's on the, on the app or the website at 3 o'clock. And someone says, what happens if it rains? <laughs> let the sarcasm, let the look say it all. It's a baptismal service. People are getting wet. It's what we do. So come on. God will protect us from the lightning. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. I've got, God, God's got a plan. Uh, men, let me talk to you real quick. Uh, hope that you can come hang out with me on Wednesday night. I've got a good friend of mine, Brady Cooper, uh, that's coming uh, to speak. Uh, Brady is hilarious and he loves Jesus. I've known Brady since seminary. Leads a, a massive church down in the Murfreesboro area and super excited to have him come and, and challenge us. And so please sign up to be a part of that. Also, uh, we're continue to care for the welfare of our city. We do that by a um, number of things. Right now we're taking up a food drive. So if you could add a little extra on, on your pickup or, or however you do groceries and uh, bring those by a Saturday afternoon. Again, that goes to care for the kids in, in our community. And last but not least, uh, the ministers and training program. Uh, again, please give uh, an offering to this beyond your tithe. Uh, again, that takes uh, time to balance out and to know your budget, but please give to this. Again, it's about it's about a thousand, ten thousand dollars for a ministry assistant, twelve thousand for uh, an intern, and around fifteen hundred, uh, fifteen thousand rather uh, annually for uh, a. a um, an apprentice. And so again, it's about a thousand, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollars per person. And again, this is us raising up leaders that are going to go and impact the kingdom of God. And that's, that's what we're talking about this year. We're talking about life in the kingdom of God. And this, this past few weeks, we've been talking about the passion of the kingdom of God. Life is hard. There are going to be challenges. If we're going to be faithful and effective, we're going to have to have passion. And so we've been talking about these five functions of the Christian's life, the disciple's life, gathering for worship, equipping for growth, 
connecting in a group, serving the church and world. And today we're going to talk about making more disciples, which this is a difficult one for many. Uh, it's difficult for a lot of reasons we'll talk about today, but we, we must understand the importance of it. So we're going to look at a text that's going to help us understand the passion to make more disciples, where it comes from. We, we all have this responsibility, but in some ways it's getting more and more difficult. And, and I get it. We get it. Uh, we're in hot water. This is a, this is a tough time. Uh, we're, we're being told by the secularists to keep our mouths shut. Uh, they say, you have a faith? Great. Keep it private. Do not bring it into the public discourse. Don't, don't bring this up in your schools. Don't bring this up at work. Don't talk about it as it pertains to any kind of policy decision making. Keep quiet. Say nothing. This is a secular society now, so we need you just to step aside and be quiet. And so there's heat there. Uh, there there's also the, the spiritualists, you know, and they just, they just want us all to pretend that all the religions teach the same things. If you take any religion serious, what you will find is that there are distinctives to that faith system. Jesus Christ is exclusive. He alone is the means by which salvation is, is afforded. It is in Christ alone that we are saved. And, and, but they're spiritualists, and I get where they're coming from. They want everyone to be nice. And so they basically say, look, can we just pretend we all worship the same God? And, and, and could you just hold it down? And there's that, that heat that comes with that. And, and then there's the moral revolutionaries who say, look, it's our time. It's enough with, with this Bible and all the stuff y'all been saying. And as a matter of fact, if you don't celebrate what we say is right, we're going to cancel you. So there is this heat that, that comes. And so when we're in this hot water, Christians, let me tell you what we can't be. We can't be like carrots. What do carrots do in hot water? They get soft. And in this hot water right now, we don't need soft Christians. We don't we need soft Christians who are going to say, oh, does that bother you? I won't say that anymore. I won't, I won't, I won't share what the Bible says. I won't share what Jesus has done. I, I won't go into those kinds of details. Well, I'll just go along with you all. We'll just kind of play it safe. Let's get soft. That's not an option for us. We also don't need eggs. What do eggs do when they get in hot water? They get hard on the inside. And, and we don't... We don't need, and, and the Bible doesn't encourage us to get hard on the inside. You know, when Christians get hard on the inside, they get angry. And they start criticizing those who are blind to God and deaf to his word as though they can help it. They, they become critical of their activities and, and they're angry that everyone's changing everything. And this isn't the country I grew up in anymore. And what's going on around here? And there's this anger, not only at, at non-believers, but even believers who maybe see a scripture different from a secondary or tertiary matter. And they make that the main thing. And so they attack, attack, attack. Why? Because they're angry. Why? Because in the hot water, they've gotten hard. They're like eggs. This is not what Christ has called us to do. You know, we're, we're meant to be like, hopefully you got one of these uh, on the way in. And, and I know we all sighed a, a sigh of disappointment when we realized they weren't M&Ms. I get it. <laughs> but what's in there? These are coffee beans. Take a nice, nice big whiff. Oh, if that doesn't stir your heart, something's wrong. I love it. The sweet lady who put these together does not like coffee. And so I giggled every day. She put 2,000 of these together with the help of some friends. We need to be like coffee beans. In hot water, carrots get soft. In hot water, eggs get hard. What happens when you put coffee beans in hot water? They don't change. They change the water. See, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be who we are in Christ Jesus. And by being who we are, we, we aren't changed. We bring about change. We, 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 we bring about a, a cultural transformation, which is a part of what we're called to do and be. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, I put this on the screen for you. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador does not represent themselves in a foreign land. An ambassador represents the, 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 the kingdom for, of which they are a citizen in a foreign land. We are ambassadors for Christ. This world's not our home. We're exiles. Our home is heaven. And we are here as ambassadors. I want to encourage you, uh, young people, put this in your backpack. Uh, put it in your car. Uh, take it to work. Put it somewhere where you can see this regularly. And remember, don't be a carrot. Don't be an egg. Be a coffee bean. Bring about transformation as the water gets hot. We are to bring about transformation by, by just being present. Look what Jesus said. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And so we're seeing that with carrots and eggs. And the heat, the hot water of our culture, there are churches, they become soft, they become irrelevant, they will die. Other, others have become mean, and they too are now irrelevant in the conversation because they're just angry. And, and they're, they're not of use to God. They're not of use to our Lord. What are we to be? Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Friends, our, our, our job is not to change society by, by demanding change, by forcing change, but by being who we are in Christ Jesus. You know what happens when, when, a, when a godly woman meets a godly man and, and they have a godly marriage, they become a godly couple. And that's a powerful, beautiful thing. I got to uh, lead a, a young couple yesterday and, and, and sharing their vows and they, they became a married couple. And if God blesses them, if God blesses you to adopt or, or to have a child, then, then you can become a, a godly family. Mom and dad, your primary responsibility is to make a disciple of your child. And, and, and so what we can have are these godly families and godly individuals. And you know what happens when godly families and, and godly individuals form into a covenant community called a local church and, and we are loving one another the way Jesus loves us and we're sharing the hope that we have with one another and we gather and we praise his holy name. There's light and there's life and there's hope and there's healing. And, and then we go from this place as God's representatives, as those who are ambassadors on behalf of Christ to, to bring about the change that, that Jesus provides through his presence and power. That's what we're called to be and do. And, and that's called making disciples. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about this, this passion to make more disciples and where it comes from. If you've got your Bible, and I hope that you do, Let's go now to 2 Timothy 2.2. 2 Timothy 2.2. Charlie's going to read for us. Let's all stand together in honor of God's word. 2 Timothy 2.2 is our text. Charlie, can you read that for us? And what you have, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. Amen. If you would be seated. Thank you, Charlie. That was not nearly a long enough text for Charlie. When Charlie was three, he informed me that he would be the next pastor of Living Hope. And so I feel a little bit, you know, challenged whenever he comes up on the stage. I'm just going to tell you right now, he's, he's, a, he's a good one. He's a keeper for sure. So a uh, little history lesson. Um, 21 years ago this month, I, I stood up on the stage as, as uh, your new pastor. And I, I shared this text, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Uh, this has become and is for me a life text. It's a, it's a scripture that guides the way I, I perceive my, my life and, and my ministry. And so uh, that, at that time, I shared with you that almost, well, no, pretty much every Sunday, you're going to hear some semblance of this text preached. You're going to hear the gospel and you're going to be challenged and equipped to, to be a disciple that makes a disciple. And I think, I think I've kept that, that promise to you. In my office, there's this picture. Uh, it's this text, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Uh, this is one of the first texts I ever memorized. Of course, back then it was NIV. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, trust reliable men will also be qualified to teach others. But I have it there in my office. Every day I'm reminded, that's why I exist. That's what I'm here to do. When I counsel people, when leaders come to meet with me, this is it. This is what we're about. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 enables me to understand the way in which we are to live out our vision here at Living Hope, our vision is to be a family of disciples, making disciples that make disciples. I know that's a mouthful, but it means a lot. We are a family of disciples, making disciples that make disciples. That's what our text tells us to do. And, and the way we live that out in a practical manner here is that we impact our homes, our neighbors, and every generation with the hope of Jesus. This is what Jesus commands. Our text today helps us understand where that passion comes from. And so three things I would encourage you to write down and remember. The first one is this. The passion to make more disciples comes from being discipled. It comes from being discipled. 
Originally, I was going to begin this series uh, with this sermon, but our preaching team got together and they said, that doesn't make sense. It seems like we should explain, you know, what a disciple lives like before we challenge everyone to go out and be disciple makers, to make sure that we're all seeking to live out what what it is that that God has commanded. If you look there at verse 2, it begins with the apostle writing to his protege, Timothy, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. What, what Paul was saying is, I'm discipling you. I have discipled you. And what a, a effective disciple makers are, are those who are being discipled. Timothy was effective because he was being discipled. Listen, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a learner, a follower, a lover of Jesus. Uh, the Greek word for this is methetes. And, and again, it means to be a learner of people, but there, there's a visceral, there's a there's a, a, something that would have come to mind in that first century when they saw this term methetes. Uh, they didn't have all the resources we have. They didn't have podcasts and books and Christian radio and, and, and all the sermons. What, what they typically had was a rabbi. They had a teacher. They had someone that, that was alive that they would interact with. And what many would do is they would say, I want, I want, to, I want to be discipled by you. And what they would do is they would basically say, I want you to teach me. I want to ask you questions. I want to see your lifestyle. I want to model my life after your lifestyle. And I want you to ask me hard questions that confront any error that's in my thinking so that I can be transformed and changed. That, that's what a disciple would do. A disciple would find someone to follow. We are called to be disciples of Jesus who make disciples. And in order to do that, we ourselves must be discipled. This, this example of, 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 of what it looks like is, is beautiful. There, there, there are lots of people that, that need this. I know I need this. This morning in my time alone with God, one of the things I, I wrote down was just, thank you God for the men and women who have discipled me. And, and I wrote out some names of those who've, who've helped disciple me, understand what it means to be a, a, a Christian What does it mean to be a a Christian husband, a Christian dad, a Christian pastor? Uh, There are people that have have walked me through uh, really hard things, asking me really hard and important questions, who've modeled for me what this looks like because I've been discipled. You know, whenever we're going to license or ordain someone, one one of the first questions we ask is, who discipled you? Who is it that has guided you in your faith? Who is it that has helped you know what it means and what it looks like? to follow Jesus. Friends, we, we all need to be discipled. And, and most of the disciple, disciple's life is about being discipled. And so I put it on the screen just to remind you at the heart, gathering for worship, what are you doing? Well, you're praising, but you're also, you're hearing the preaching of the word. You're being discipled, connecting in a group. There are leaders and friends that disciple us mutually, equip. We have a, a, a master teacher who's discipling in truth and, and creating discussion, serving the church and world. We use our gifts to disciple each other in, in, in the ways in which we, we serve God. And, and as those who are discipled, we are to make disciples. Friends, you're being discipled. Everybody in this room is being Here's a question. I want you to answer this question. Who's discipling you? Fox News? CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, the latest movie, the latest episodes on whatever streaming devices you use. Someone is influencing you to think and to feel and to live a specific way. Who's discipling you? Everyone's being discipled. We are called by God as children of God to be discipled by disciples so that we can turn around and make disciples. Friends, make sure the ones who are discipling you are are teaching you to think like Jesus. Make sure the ones that are discipling you are teaching you to love like Jesus. And make sure for sure that they're teaching you to live like Jesus. You're being discipled. Make sure you're being discipled by someone who's teaching you to love and to live and to think like Jesus. And, and as one who's being discipled, make disciples. Second thing, write it down. Remember, the passion to make more disciples comes from basic obedience. Making disciples is not meant to be for the, you know, the legendary, the, the, the high-end elite Christians. 
D -d Disciple making is not optional. It's like being alive. It's, it's breathing. It's as common as breathing for a living being. If you're a Christian, you make disciples. If you're a living being, you breathe in and out. What it says, look back at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. So discipleship happens best men to men, women to women. Discipleship, one-on-one -on -one discipleship happens best men with men, women with women. Why? Because it's intimate. It's an intimate activity. Having someone know what's going on in your heart, and your mind, having them be able to speak into that, that's a very intimate activity. That's why it happens best first and foremost at home. Mom and dad, you are to make disciples of your children. And that is one of your highest privileges. It, it is the highest and greatest important thing that you will do. That's why in the last hour, we're giving space and time and energy to, to have leaders do our, our, our parent training. Because there's nothing more important than for you as mom and dads to be making disciples of your children. Mom and dad, you are discipling your children. What are you discipling them to? When, when your children think of who you are, the kind of person you are and the things that you do, how do they picture you? Do they picture you talking about the Bible? Do they picture you talking about Jesus? Do they picture you praying and talking to Jesus? Do they picture you in church? Do they picture you amongst other believers? Do they picture you in seeking to be faithful? Or do they picture you scrolling nonsense on your phone? Do they picture you watching nonsense on a screen? Do they, do they picture you not there because you're out pursuing success or whatever God it is that's more important to you. You're discipling your children. Friends, disciple them to be disciples of Jesus who think, love, and live like Jesus. It happens best at home and it also happens really well uh, at church. As I use my gifts, you use gifts, we use our gifts. It happens best amongst our friends at work, at school, with our neighbors as we're simply being who we are, the coffee beans we are, as the hot water gets hotter, we, we, we are able to, to permeate the, the environment. Unfortunately, the way it typically, usually, most often happens is, is in the most narrow way. And, and that is through a preacher preaching to masses. Now again, it's effective and it's commanded in scripture, but it, it's... In our day and time, it's, it's the least effective, and here's why. And I'm going to put this on the screen just so you can kind of grip it, get a grasp of it. Statisticians tell us that a majority of our culture will not go to or return to church. On any given Sunday, less than 15% of Bowling Green is in a Bible teaching church. That means 85% of the people who need to be made disciples won't come here. We must go to them. And you're sitting next to them at school and they are your neighbors and they are people at work. They are people that hang out and like to, have, to enjoy the hobbies that you enjoy. They are all around you. Are you making disciples of them? If not, it's probably because you don't have the confidence to do it. And the reason you don't have the confidence to do it is probably because you've not been been led and felt competent to make a disciple. Just in your heart right there, I mean, do you really feel competent to make a disciple? I mean, if someone were to walk up to you this afternoon and say, can you lead me to a vibrant personal relationship with Jesus Christ and show me how to live for him the rest of my life? What would your response be? There's, there's a lot of folks who would say, um, I'm going to take you to church next Sunday. I'm going to introduce you to, to our pastor. He's crazy, but he's all right. Look what Jesus said. This is Matthew 28. Real quick, leave your finger in 2 Timothy 2. To go with me to the Great Commission. Let's go to Matthew 28. It's the last three verses of, of the, the Gospel of Matthew. While you're turning there, let me tell you something we're going to do next Sunday. Next Sunday... Uh, Two o'clock, three o'clock, I know there's a game, I know there's a lot going on. If you want to be made competent in disciple making, show up at Scottsville Road 
and Pastor Will's going to help you. He's going to teach you the method that we use here and around the world to make disciples. Again, that's not going to be the be-all, end-all. It's going to be a great start for you to understand how to do it. If you're a leader, and you are a leader, if you're a member of Living Hope, you are a leader, and you're not competent to do this, make the time. Be there. Be there because you've been commanded to to make disciples. This is the last words of Jesus. Jesus said uh, to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. To make a disciple, first of all, we have to recognize, look at verse 18, the authority of Jesus. Jesus alone can say, when we, when we talk through three circles, we, we always point out that, that beautiful word gospel means good news. It's the fact that God left heaven, took on human form, died on the cross, was raised on the third day and is soon returning. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And it's our responsibility to know that this, this Jesus has the authority to save. And we got to be intentional. Look at verse 19. Be intentional about telling people about Jesus. Wherever you go. This, this whole idea of, of, of being on mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The go is not the, is, 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 that, that's not the command. This is, that's a participle. It, it, maybe a better way of saying this, as you are going, make disciples. As you're going, the command is make disciples. As you're going to school, as you're going to work, as you're hanging out in your neighborhood, as you're enjoying your hobbies, as you're playing your sports, as you're doing the things that, that, you, that you'd like to spend your time doing, make disciples. Let them know who Christ is and what he's accomplished and what, what he can do. And, and be willing to go out of the way. Make disciples, boy, this is a tough one, of all nations. Next month, we're going to begin to talk about the gift of Christ. And we're going to talk about the ways that we're going to go. If you're a covenant member, I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to pray this way. Say, Lord, I'm assuming you want me to go overseas next year. Unless I hear otherwise, direct me. Assume you're supposed to go. Assume that you're going to be on mission. Assume that you're going to be a part of this. It, it requires a time commitment. It requires all kinds of intentionality. But again, go make disciples of all nations and then baptize them. Today, we're baptizing people, letting them make public profession of their saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. See, what's happened to a lot of, of Christians in North America and really really all over the world. We're seeing the, the results of this all over the world. Is, are there are people who have made a decision for Christ and maybe have even been baptized, but they've never been taught to observe all that Jesus commanded them. They, they've become converts, but not disciples. Bill Hull, which is one of my heroes, he, he explains the difference in his book. I highly recommend this book, uh, Conversion and Discipleship. Here, here's what he says. Conversion is theological slang for when a person decides to become a Christian. And I cannot tell you how many people we talk to who say, oh yeah, yeah, I was saved at vacation Bible school when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I went to, I went to youth camp. I made that decision. Oh, I was at a revival service. Okay, so you're a convert. What about discipleship? Discipleship occurs when someone answers the call to learn from Jesus and others how to live his or her life as though Jesus were living it. As a result, the disciple becomes the kind of person who naturally does, naturally does what Jesus did. The, the problem with much Christianity in North America in particular is we have a whole lot of con converts and not very many disciples. We don't have people who are growing in what it means to think like, love like, and live like Jesus. And, and so there's not the competence which gives confidence to do what Paul told Timothy to entrust to faithful men. There's not a lot of women who are entrusting to faithful women who will be able to teach others. Converts can't teach much other than an experience and an experience is flimsy. What, what is needed is the word of God, a disciple that can teach others how to live like Christ. And to do it, Jesus has chosen us. And so the third thing I, I want to capture your imagination with is this. The passion to make more disciples comes from bold vision. Jesus could have chosen to change the world any way he wanted to. He could have made the salvation process what the Apostle Paul experienced in Acts chapter 9. Showing up, knocking us off our high horse literally, 
blinding us until we repented and, and we're saved. He could have done that, but that's not what he chose to do. Instead, Jesus has decided that he is going to make known the gospel of God through the church, through us as individuals. The model Jesus chose is audacious. So you think about what, what, what Paul is saying here and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here's the picture. I put it on the screen for you. Paul, the disciple Timothy. Timothy was to disciple faithful men and those faithful men were to disciple other men. The vision is bold. Acts 1.8 is the vision. I want to encourage you uh, to know next Sunday we're going to go, we're going to be in this text. We're going to be in Acts 1, 1 through 8. As a matter of fact, next Sunday we're beginning our study of the book of Acts. And so uh, we don't have any more of these. I'm sorry, we sold out. But we're going to try to order more. Um, Charity, heads up on that. Um, so, so this is, what this is, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a journal. It has the, the Acts and then space for you to write sermon notes and journal entries about how you're experiencing God. We want to get everyone to train to do this because next year we're going to be studying Ephesians, Galatians, uh, Philippians, and Colossians. And we're going we're gonna to have these available so you can write notes. And so if you'll start next week, uh, if we can get them, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can have those five books. But Acts 1.8, I'm going to put it on the screen for you. We're going to look at this in more detail. But look at this vision. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You, ordinary people, you, people who were born with sin but saved by grace, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. Now that word is very, very important. It's, 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 the, it's the Greek word uh, martus. It's where we get the word martyr. From the very beginning, Jesus knew we would be in hot water. And he knew that in order for us to make disciples, it would be costly. That it would be hard and that it would hurt. And so he uses this word from the beginning. You will be my martyrs. You will be my witnesses. You will be in the hot water. Don't be a carrot. Don't be an egg. Be like a coffee bean. Now, let me give you a, a bold vision for just living hope. Now, I remind you, I'm a religion major. I am not a math major, all right? So, so again, if the numbers are wrong, forgive me. Be gracious to me. Get the picture, though. Here's the math. Living Hope has just over 2,700 covenant members. Starting this year, if every member of Living Hope made one disciple per year, and those we disciple make one disciple per year, that make one disciple per year, we would reach over 11 billion people in the next 23 years. Now, someone after the first service told me it would happen in 22 years. If you could check on that, I'd appreciate it. If I'm wrong, let it go. If I'm right, let me know so I can let him know. It's just between us though, okay? Think about that for a moment. I can't reach 11 pe billion people. You can't reach 11 billion people. But you know what? Everybody in this room could make one disciple of one person in the next 12 months. We live in a city where 85% of the population needs it. We live in a nation with the same, same statistics worldwide the need is even greater, billions. Surely, in the next 12 months, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you could make one disciple of Jesus who can make one disciple of Jesus. The picture is beautiful. Paul to Timothy. Timothy to, to, another, to others who are faithful, who could reach others. Friends, you won't do that being a carrot. Soft in the hot water. You, you won't do that being an egg, hard-hearted. Being like a coffee bean, absolutely. Now to do it, again, you need to be trained. And again, we're going to offer this next Sunday, but I'm going to throw this out to you. If you want to be trained to be a disciple maker, if you want to be discipled, I challenge you, contact one of our staff this week 
and either we or someone we've trained will disciple you. We will be in contact with you within a week to get you started. Again, that's going to take intentionality on your part. That's going to take you saying, hey, I, I, I'm open. You can direct message us. You can go to the app. You can go to the website. You can email us. We will be responsive to you within the week. We need to be trained so that we will be competent, which will produce confidence. And pray. Pray boldly. Before I became, became a Christian, I, I heard there was a youth group where the youth pastor had challenged the young people to think about a person. If they were to be saved, that it would prove that there had to be a God. And I found out that my name was put on that list. And there were people who began to boldly pray that a lunatic would get saved. You know any lunatics that need to be saved? I mean, really, do you know people that need Jesus? I want to challenge you to create something. This is called an impact map. This is the part of the training that we do with three big things. So you're to be that first little circle. Put, you put your name in there. And then you think through three people that you know that are not walking faithfully with Jesus. And you begin to boldly pray that they would become faithful disciples of Jesus that can make disciples. And then you get crazy. And from each of those people you're reaching, you create three more circles with three more lines connected to them. And you begin to pray, Lord, if, if I could make a disciple of them, who could they make a disciple of? And you begin to think like Paul. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful ones who are able to reach others. Four generations of disciple making. That's how we need to picture our lives. Someone's discipling you. Who are you choosing to disciple you? Who are you making a disciple of? Are you making a disciple of Jesus? Here's what I know. If you're not walking with Jesus, you can't make a disciple of Jesus. If you've never repented of your sin and believed in, in, in Christ, you're not a disciple of Jesus, and that needs to be your first step. But if you have, if you have made Christ your Savior and Lord, friend, are you really obeying your King? Are you His ambassador? Are you making disciples as His Word clearly commands? You may need a life change. Your, your bold prayer maybe needs to be for you. Let's stand together as we pray. Care leaders, if you don't mind to come forward again, these folks are here to serve you, to pray with you and encourage you in any way they can. But we're going to sing about the goodness of God. And, and as we do, I want to I challenge you to come and pray that you will be bold. Pray that you can be saved. Pray that the Lord will make us a disciple-making church. Let's pray together. Father, we see what your word commands. Holy Spirit, Help us to do it. Do not let us be theoretical Christians who theorize about the idea of making disciples rather than being doers of your word. Convict us, Holy Spirit. Show us where we have not been faithful as parents and as friends, as co-workers, and as, as those who, who live in a city where there's a lot of lostness. Move our hearts, O oh God. Make us faithful to your will. You're good. You are a good God. And you call us to this good work. So I pray that some today will come and receive your grace. That many will come and pray boldly for salvation. For others to be made disciples of you. Do it, Lord Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How good is he?
Your people that as we leave this place we will find people that need to know the truth 